Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Revolution 250 podcast. Revolution 250 is an organization that is dedicated to commemorating the events leading up to the American Revolution. I'm Bradley Jay, and our co-host is Bob Allison. He's a history professor at Suffolk University and the chair of Rev 250. Thanks to producer Jonathan Lane for setting up this interview with William Morgan Fowler Jr., a history professor at Northeastern in Boston and an author and served as director of the Massachusetts Historical Society for a few years, I guess about seven years, ending in 2005. How do you do, sir? And Bob Allison, why don't you start things off this morning? Great. Thank you, Bradley. And it's great to see you, Professor Fowler. Well, thank you for the invitation. Great. Now, you've written about maritime history, and the revolution at sea is one of the topics you have covered. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what, what's happening seaward. Well, one of the things to keep in mind when thinking about 18th century America and the period of the revolution is that Americans, and if we can use that term Americans here, were really a sea-minded people. It was the ocean that, was, that brought them here from Europe. Uh, it was the ocean that was their highway back to Europe. And it was also the ocean that was a moat that protected them uh, from Europeans and from aggression from the British and the French and the Spanish and what have you. So right from the very beginning, sea-minded people, uh, about 25 to 30,000 men at, on the eve of the American Revolution were involved in maritime affairs in the American colonies. They were the single largest proletariat group. It's primarily, of course, an agricultural area to be sure. Uh, but those who lived in urban areas were almost always on the front of the ocean. So the sea was very much in the minds of these people. It's also true that American sailors in the period before the American Revolution were often uh, impressed by the Royal Navy. So you have here a group of many thousands of men who have grievances against His Majesty uh, for what His Majesty's Royal Navy has done to them. And they're also the people who are most often involved in the urban riots. Uh, they're quite available uh, for any adventure, uh, the Tea Party being an example, or the tearing down of statues in New York City. You always find these mobs uh, laced with a lot of sailors. And so the sea and, and sea ventures, entrepreneurship was very much at the heart of the American economy. So when the war breaks out, when the revolution breaks out, it was quite natural. Uh, for so many Americans to want to fight against his majesty, fight for American freedom, and do it with the tools they had at their hand, and those would be the tools of sailors. Uh, so they went a privateering. Uh, now, I must say here, privateering is often misunderstood. So many times I've heard privateers referred to as pirates. They were not pirates. Uh, in time of war, if you owned a vessel, you could go to the local authorities. In the time when the king ruled, you'd go to the royal governor. In the time of the American Revolution, you might go to the elected governor or the local assembly. And you would ask for a commission. And the commission was sort of a hunting license. And this allowed you to go and attack the enemies, in this case, the British. And so privateering was quite legal. It was not piracy probably somewhere in the nature of more than 2,000, you can imagine this, 2,000 vessels took tearing commissions from American sources during the revolution. When I say American sources, I mean that the Continental Congress sitting in Philadelphia commissioned privateers, but privateers were also commissioned by all of the states. Massachusetts commissioned privateers, Rhode Island commissioned privateers. So they swarmed the seas. Now, privateers were out for profit, not necessarily to, uh, they did not want to engage any of the warships of his majesty, so they looked for vulnerable prey, looked for merchantmen, uh, and it was dangerous business, very, very dangerous business, and when on occasion a privateer might encounter a vessel of the Royal Navy, things didn't go well. So, privateering, an important part of the war at sea for Americans, but then also, the Continental Congress decided that uh, they wanted to have their own Navy, which was a bit of a preposterous idea when you think about it, uh, because building major warships was a huge, huge task. Uh, in the 18th century, as in the 21st century, the largest 
physical things that man builds that move a ships. They're just huge. And they are of huge expense. But given the optimism of our founding fathers, they wouldn't allow anything to get in the way of founding a Navy. And so they began here in Massachusetts. When George Washington arrived in Cambridge to take command of the Continental Navy, I'm sorry, the Continental Army uh, in July of 1775, uh, he was approached very soon after his arrival by a local man from Marblehead. His name was John Glover. And Glover was a <clears throat> prominent patriot, uh, Colonel John Glover he was. And Glover persuaded Washington that there might be an advantage to getting warships out in Massachusetts Bay to attack the British ships that were coming in. At this moment, 1775, the British are holed up in Boston, surrounded by Washington's army. The only way they can survive and be resupplied is by sea. Well, the British, arrogant that they are, have believed that they have no fear of the Americans on the water. So uh, British supply vessels are coming into Boston unarmed without an escort. They are prey to be pounced upon. And so Washington takes Glover's advice and he commissions charters, rents, if you like, some vessels to go out and sail to capture British ships. Now, not coincidentally, uh, the first vessel that Washington charters happens to be the Hannah from Marblehead, Massachusetts, owned by John Glover. Well, nonetheless, Hannah sails out and soon she's joined by other vessels that Washington charters, and they're very, very successful. They managed to capture British supply ships and bring much needed ammunition, clothing, etc., to Washington's army. So this is a good move. In Philadelphia, where the Continental Congress is meeting, they see what is happening in Massachusetts Bay. And so the Continental Congress decides that they will create a Continental Navy. So on October the 13th, 1775, the Continental Congress resolves to charter, again, to rent some vessels in the name of the Continental Congress. This, by the way, October 13th, 1775, is taken to be the birthday of the American Navy. So thus begins the official war against the British at sea. So you really have at least two navies, shall we say, uh, armed, seeking to attack British, the Continental Navy, uh, the privateers, and then there's actually a third navy, if you can believe it, the Americans put to sea. The third navy are the state navies. 12 of the 13 colonies launched their own state navies, including Massachusetts. So you have this conglomeration then of privateers, of state navies, and of continental ships sailing against the British. Uh, the British are taken, somewhat taken aback at the beginning of the revolution by being uh, pestered, shall we say, by all these American vessels. Uh, but as the Royal Navy is highly efficient, best in the world in the 18th century, uh, they very quickly come to grips and are able to deal with these American privateers, state navies, and the Continental Navy. So in the course of the war, these American navies, shall we call them, are pretty much confined, uh, not completely destroyed, uh, but their, uh, their advantages against the British are minimal. They do some wonderful service, that's true, but in the total effect of the American Revolution, I think you would have to say that the American privateers, state navies, and the Continental Navy were not terribly effective. Uh, now, there are some glorious moments, to be sure, that give great naval heritage, great memory, uh, chief among them, and I guess everyone knows John Paul Jones, uh, who was a, indeed a continent, continental captain, captain the, the American vessel Bonhomme Richard, in that very famous adventure that he went out to be. Uh, Jones is an intriguing character, something of a scoundrel, really, a rascal. <clears throat> He's born John Paul, that's, that's his born name. He's from Scotland, uh, sails as a young man and ends up in the Caribbean just before the American Revolution. Uh, there in the Caribbean, he's involved in uh, some nefarious activities. It seems to be the murder, in fact, of a fellow crewman. Uh, 
And so he decides to leave the Caribbean. He leaves at a providential moment. He arrives in Virginia, uh, just at the outbreak of the American Revolution. And by the way, when he arrives in Virginia, he decides to change his name to Jones. So now he's John Paul Jones. Uh, he persuades some people in the Congress, he's a very adept seaman. So they commission him an officer in the Continental Navy. And Jones then takes a Continental Navy vessel to sea. Jones always wants a bigger ship. He always wants a bigger ship. And he becomes a real pain to the Continental Congress with his insistence that he wants a bigger ship. And so they decide what they're going to do is they're going to ship him off to France. Because in France, of course, is Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin has the habit of never being able to say no to anyone. So the Continental Congress figures that if they send John Paul Jones to France, and he will ask Benjamin Franklin to, give, to ask the French to give him a big ship. It seems all kind of convoluted, but that was the plan. So John Paul Jones does indeed sail to France. He has some adventures in between, but it's really to France that he's focused now. And there in France, yes, indeed, he associates with Benjamin Franklin, the master of politics. And Benjamin Franklin, oh yes, manages to persuade the French to give John Paul Jones a bigger ship. Of course, it's a bigger ship, but it's also a wreck of a ship. It is the Duke de Duras. She's an old, lubberly, leaky East Indiaman, which means she used to be trading for the French to India. But nonetheless, it's the best he's going to get. So he takes the Duke de Duras, and then a good man at public relations, John Paul Jones renames his vessel Bonhomme Richard, in honor, of course, good man Richard, poor Richard's almanac, the publication that had made Benjamin Franklin famous. Well, John Paul Jones now is off on adventure. He's going to sail around the British Isles, tormenting the British, terrorizing the British, which he manages to do, by the way. Uh, it, the British Royal Navy is not accustomed to being attacked in their own waters. It's a great embarrassment, a great embarrassment. So Jones comes around the north of, uh, of Scotland, comes down through the North Sea. And then in the North Sea, he picks up a local fisherman. And the fisherman tells him some exciting news. The exciting news is that the Baltic fleet is on its way home. Now, in the 18th century, it's all about wood. It's all about wood, wood for the ships, wood for the mass. Wood to an 18th century Navy is what petroleum is to us today. It is the absolute heart of the functioning of the fleet. And the Baltic fleet was coming back from, uh, from Russia and Finland, bringing back all of the naval stores, tar, pitch, turpentine, timber, that were so essential to the Royal Navy. Jones thought to himself, aha, here's a great prize. So he lies in wait on the east coast of England off a place called Flamborough Head. There he waits until finally he spots, his lookout spots, the Baltic fleet coming down. Jones, of course, immediately hoists a British flag. The 18th century, they didn't care. Fly any flag you want, we're gonna pretend we're British. And so he pretends to be a British ship. As the Baltic fleet approaches John Paul Jones, the lead British frigate that is escorting the HMS Scarborough calls over to Jones, who are you? And Jones replies, we are the Princess Royal. And at the same time, they open their gun ports and the battle begins. Well, it is by any standards, as they say, a rollicking battle between HMS Serapis and the Bonhomme Richard. Uh, in the aftermath, of course, Bonhomme Richard wins the battle. Uh, Serapis sinks. Her captain, Rich, comes on board uh, Bonhomme Richard and surrenders his sword to John Paul Jones. It's a great victory, and one that, of course, is memorialized by the United States Navy. Just a, an example, of course, Jones, that's, that's the highlight of his career, really. After the war, Jones goes off. He ends up in Paris, and he dies in Paris. He's buried, but no one remembers where he's buried. So John Paul Jones gets forgotten for over 100 years until, until Teddy Roosevelt becomes president of the United States. Teddy Roosevelt, who's a great Navy man, wants to promote the Navy, and he gets a cable from the American ambassador 
in France. We have discovered John Paul Jones's body. How do they know it's John Paul Jones? Because when they buried him, they buried him in a cask of brandy. Yes, he's, his body is mummified in brandy. Not to get too graphic, but if you look at the mummified body and you look at Houdin's bust of John Paul Jones, you can see it's John Paul Jones. Roosevelt sends a battleship to bring John Paul Jones home. Bring him home, they bring him to the Naval Academy. And of course, maybe some of your listeners have actually seen him. John Paul Jones is buried there in the chapel of the Naval Academy in great splendor, incredible splendor. This huge marble sarcophagus held aloft by four leaping bronze dolphins. So John Paul Jones is probably the best known personage from the American Navy in the revolution. But one thing I will say about the American Navy, while they, John Paul Jones epitomized the bravery and courage of the men who did go to sea, one thing that the American Navy did manage to do, and it was of some importance, is that their ships managed to keep the American colonies in contact with Europe uh, so that uh, mail and diplomats were dispatched and brought back and forth across the Atlantic by the Continental Navy. And that was indeed a great contribution to the war. And their contribution too was establishing a, a tradition of bravery and courage, which the later American Navy reconstituted, of course, in the federal period under, the, under George Washington would go on to greater glory. But the Continental Navy then in, in the American Revolution played a role, but I would have to say not necessarily a pivotal role. But let me just add one thing. So while the Continental Navy didn't play a pivotal role in the American Revolution, navies did. The American Revolution was won by battles at sea. Uh, in 1778, the French joined us as our ally. Once the French joined us in the war, it presented a huge problem for the Royal Navy because now they were confronted with a worldwide war. Before that, they're only concerned with putting down a small rebellion in the colonies. Now they had to wage war all around the globe. And the Royal Navy had to disperse its forces to deal with the French in various parts of the world. In one climactic battle of perhaps one of the greatest, most important naval battles in American history took place in 1781. I'm sure your listeners will remember that the General Cornwallis uh, is in in Carolinas, uh, having difficulty subduing the Carolinas. He had been left there by General Clinton. And Cornwallis, having trouble in the Carolinas, decides to march north, and he marches north to Virginia. He marches to a place called Yorktown. And there at Yorktown, he awaits to be relieved by the British who are coming down from New York. The British fleet coming down from New York to extract, to evacuate General Cornwallis and his army. That British fleet coming down from New York is met by a French fleet coming up from the Caribbean. It is the, called the Battle of the Capes, the Chesapeake Capes. It is in that battle between the French fleet and the British fleet that the British are forced to withdraw. Once the British withdraw, General Cornwallis's fate is sealed. So that battle off the Capes, the French Navy defeating the British Navy, forcing them to withdraw was pivotal in the American Revolution and resulted, of course, in the surrender of General Cornwallis at Yorktown. Did the uh, Navy have more of an effect in the Civil War? I, uh, Stephen Mallory squandered a bunch of resources uh, dealing with the Navy that he could have used elsewhere. I, the folks say that's a mistake. And also there are the battles uh, down in the, the bayous of Louisiana. Could you talk about those gunboat battles and, and the general effect the Navy had in the Civil War? Well, the Civil War was uh, an example of, yes, in, in some ways, the Confederacy uh, wasted resources in building vessels that they could not, they could never build enough, nor could they build them as fine. Where the Confederates did, in fact, invest money and resources wisely was in building Confederate raiders. These were ships, most of them built abroad, many of them in England, uh, that then raided the high seas and raided Union vessels, Union uh, merchant ships. And that did distract the American Navy. But in the Civil War, the principal role of the American Navy was to blockade the Southern coast, which they did fairly effectively. The blockades are never, never completely effective. But during the Civil War, they did in fact manage to, uh, to blockade the Southern coast and to isolate the South, which was of critical importance. Uh, 
You mentioned gunboats, and that's an interesting aspect of American naval history. Uh, in the early part of the 18th, 19th century, uh, when once again, after the American Revolution, we're having great trouble with the British, uh, we needed to find a way to defend our ports. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was president. Uh, Jefferson was a man who, uh, who was, he was a man of economy, shall we say. And navies are very expensive. Building big ships are very expensive. Uh, just to give your listeners an example, uh, a vessel like USS Constitution, 44 guns, uh, she would have a crew of 500 men. So they're hugely expensive. Well, Jefferson thought he didn't want to build big ships. They were too expensive. So we'll build gunboats. And so Jefferson was a great proponent of the gunboat Navy, building small vessels, vessels that were maybe 40 feet or 50 feet uh, in length, man manning uh, about you know, 15 or 20 men with one cannon. And these gunboats were intended to defend our ports uh, in any, should anyone attack. Uh, the gunboats proved to be of some use in shallow waters. You mentioned the bayous of Louisiana. Uh, certainly down there, they tormented the British. But in general, the gunboats were really too small and too ineffective. It was an example of a, a trying to a small technology that did not have the impact that was intended. Rob? Thank you. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about two of the, or one or two of the big characters in Massachusetts that you've written about, you know, John Hancock, Samuel Adams. And you know, Hancock, I'm told, was a mediocre person and uh, with an inflated ego. I wonder if you could address that. Oh my goodness, mediocre person. That sounds so damning. Who, who are we to who are we he to was it. <laughs> who are we 200 years later? I will, I certainly can testify that he had an, an enormous ego. Of that, there is there is no question. Uh, John Hancock was one of the few, I think, 18th century politicians who could make it in politics today. Uh, he was a man of great style. He was apparently an eloquent man. Uh, he was a man, again, of great ego. He also knew how to uh, persuade people. And in fact, it's necessary to bribe people. He wasn't above that at all. Uh, he was a very charming character. Now, his bete noir here in Massachusetts was quite the opposite. Samuel Adams. And by the way, it's Samuel. No one called him Sam in his own time. Uh, his wife used to address him as Mr. Adams, in fact. But Samuel Adams was quite different. Samuel Adams was a man of the people, and I mean that in the truest sense. He was a very provincial man. Samuel Adams was a parochial person. He was devoted to the cause of his town, Boston, and his state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He was very jealous of any power that tried to intrude itself, including the powers of the Continental Congress and later the powers of the federal government. Uh, he was much, much, very, very protective. He was also a man who lived a much more simple kind of life. Uh, in fact, it's said that the first time he ever rode a horse was when he went off to the Continental Congress. And when he went off to the Continental Congress for, in 1774, uh, it, a, an apocryphal story has it that a group of Boston patriots took up a collection, and the collection was used to buy Samuel Adams a fine suit of clothes, which he did not own before. So Samuel Adams and John Hancock were very, very different people. When they both went to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, Hancock, rich, well-to-do merchant, associated with other rich, well-to-do merchants from Philadelphia, New York, and other places. Samuel Adams, on the other hand, associated himself with other radicals, particularly people from Virginia. And there was a, a, a very distinct separation. It would be wrong to call it political parties because they're not well organized. But the Continental Congress divided really into two sets of people. There were the nationalists and the, shall we call them the town meetingites. The nationalists, the people like John Hancock and some others, had a rather national view, uh, a, a, a view of a nation united, uh, not only against the British, but united later as well. Samuel Adams and others were more town meetingites. Their loyalties were embedded in their local communities. They feared, they despised national authority. Uh, 
and so they had different different views, and that carried through into the new republic. Uh, ironically, this Hancock is elected governor of the Commonwealth in 1780. He's reelected every every time he runs. He's reelected. People just love him, and then Samuel Adams is elected lieutenant governor, uh, and they sort of reconcile in a way, but not really. Except that when John Hancock dies in 1793, Samuel Adams becomes Becomes the governor of the Commonwealth. Uh, there is, again, an important role that the two of them play uh, in the ratification of the federal constitution. Uh, the federal constitution, of course, written in, in Philadelphia and then distributed to the states for ratification. In each of the states, a special ratification convention was called so that each state had its, its own. In 12 of the states, Rhode Island, uh, uh, Rhode Island stayed away from all of this. She'll come into the union later. Here in Massachusetts, which is critical, critical, things are a little uneasy. Uh, just the year before we're discussing ratification, there had been something called Shays' Rebellion. We're in the Western part of the Commonwealth and in other parts of the Commonwealth too. Uh, farmers had risen up to close down courts. Debtors had risen up. They were fighting against having their farms and property taken away from them, foreclosures, and they were fighting against that. So they were fighting to close down the legal system. Some people call it a rebellion. I think that gives it more than it deserves. They were uprisings to be sure, but they certainly scared people. They scared people that this was clearly a, a, the anarchy. Do we hear about anarchy today? An anarchy in the field, but it was much exaggerated really. So when the Massachusetts Convention convened in Boston, uh, the image of the Shays' Rebellion, as it was called, was still very much in people's minds. And in fact, a goodly number, a goodly number uh, of Shaysites, as they were called, actually sat in the ratifying convention. These Shaysites and others were very, very, very skeptical of national power, very skeptical of national power. And so Ratification in Massachusetts was an iffy proposition, a very iffy proposition. John Hancock presided. Of course, as usual, when things got tough, John Hancock left. And what he would often do in moments when the politics were not quite maybe turning his way, he'd become ill. So while he was the presiding officer, he wasn't really presiding. He was home in his mansion on Beacon Hill tending to his goat, he said couldn't come to the meeting, couldn't come to the meeting, avoiding any controversy. The vote is coming to be taken. And the story is told that Samuel Adams, who by the way, who lived down near where Macy's is today on Winter Street, that Samuel Adams was home and there came a knock on his door and he opened the door and there was Paul Revere. Now Paul Revere was not of the social standing of Samuel Adams or John Hancock. Paul Revere was a mechanic that is, he was a man who worked with his hands. Nonetheless, of course, he was a renowned patriot. And he was a firm supporter of the Constitution. He had come to see Samuel Adams. He said, Mr. Adams, the people have spoken. And when he meant that, he meant the mechanics, the men he was associated with. He said, the people have spoken, Mr. Adams, and they support the Constitution. And Adams looked at him and said, Mr. Revere, is that true? They all do. And he said, yes, Mr. Adams, they do. The next day, the convention convened again. It had been meeting for some time. Hancock was now in the chair. He was back. He was back. And so comes the moment when both Adams and says, I support the Constitution. Almost immediately thereafter, John Hancock rose and said, I support the Constitution. The support of those two men changed the day, and the Constitution was ratified in Massachusetts by a relatively slim margin. If Samuel Adams and John Hancock had not voiced their support for the Constitution, it probably would not have been ratified in Massachusetts, and that would have meant a whole different ending to the American Revolution. We're with uh, William Morgan Fowler, Jr., professor of history at Northeastern U and uh, former director of the Massachusetts Historical Society, talking about events leading up to the revolution, which is what Revolution 250 is all about. Uh, about John Hancock, are there one or two events that 
made him move from being primarily a merchant to more of a patriot? Uh, yes. Um, the prime reason, again, John Hancock is a man of great eminence in Boston, lives in the grandest house in the town, sits up there on top of Beacon Hill. But he's a colonial. He's a colonial. That is to say, no matter how rich he is, no matter what his status is in Boston, he's still seen snubbed, snubbed by his English correspondence. In his correspondence with his English agents, his factors, it is very, very interesting. On more than one occasion, he becomes angry at them for treating him in such a disrespectful fashion. And I think that is really at the heart of him and others too, for that matter, that here they were men of eminence and accomplishment and they were snubbed. And that is one of the reasons that they revolted, that, that led to the rebellion. It, personal ego, yes. But they were also committed to political principles. In 1775, the government of Massachusetts was older than probably many of the state governments we have today. We had a long tradition I wouldn't call it self-government, that exaggerates a little bit because we were loyal subjects of the king. But nonetheless, we were accustomed to choosing our own people to govern us. And that was a, an event, that was a feeling that ran very deep. Samuel Adams, for example, and John Hancock. So when you combine these two, when you get the events of the 1760s, when clearly parliament and the ministry is intervening in ways that are unprecedented, in the previous century or more century of government in, the, in Massachusetts. You realize that these people then are revolting against A, what they have a personal feeling, they feel personally assaulted and their political principles as well. I think there is a wonderful anecdotal story that kind of sums this up in a way that comes from 1638, if you can imagine. In 1638, the people of Sudbury, you know, the town just west of Concord, were having some sort of dispute within their community. And so when the general court in Boston heard about this dispute, they decided to send a committee to Sudbury to solve this for the people of Sudbury. When the committee arrived on the outskirts of the town of Sudbury, they, they were met by the selectmen of the town. The selectmen of the town told this committee coming from Boston, we will be judged by men of our own choosing. You may go home. And that sort of summarizes the way the people of Massachusetts felt in their towns for 100 and nearly 150 years and how Samuel Adams and John Hancock felt. We will be judged by men of our own choosing. And when that was challenged by the ministry and by the parliament in fairly dramatic ways in the 1760s and the early 1770s, that 150 years of self-government rose up in opposition. Bob? This is great. I wonder if you could just tell us, John Hancock, I think, wanted to be commander of the Continental Army. I wonder if you could say a few words about that. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So, well, you know, now, well, let's be fair. Let's be fair. Uh, John Hancock was the colonel of the cadets. Now, the cadets were, uh, they're still around today. Today, it's the first Corps of Cadets. Uh, the cadets in John Hancock's time did most of the time parading and drinking. Uh, that's what they did. But he was the colonel of the cadets, so he, he, had, he had a uniform. Well, come 1775, of course, uh, the events of April 19th have passed. There is a, an army, a militia army, surrounding the British in Boston, uh, but it's an army made up mostly of New Englanders. Uh, the British are now confined within the town of Boston. Uh, and there comes a petition from the uh, Provincial Congress of Massachusetts. The petition is to the Continental Congress, which is now meeting in Philadelphia, discussing the events of Boston. And the petition from the Massachusetts Provincial Congress is, will you adopt the army gathered outside of Boston? Uh, Massachusetts was having trouble, of course, supporting this army. And so the petition is to adopt the army surrounding Boston, asking the Continental Congress to do that. 
The Congress takes it under discussion and they do agree. They do agree uh, to adopt the army. It, it come, becomes now a continental army. Well, a continental army needs a continental commander. In the body of the Congress meeting there, June 1775, there is only one man, one man who arrives in uniform. Of course, it is George Washington, the Colonel Virginia Militia. Washington is seated in the back of the room in uniform. Washington has a uh, mixed history as a military commander. In fact, uh, more defeats than victories. Uh, but nonetheless, he's a man of great stature. There's no question about that. George Washington is an eminent, an eminent American, eminent Virginian. Everyone knows who he is. And he's sitting there in uniform. Well, comes the moment, of course, to nominate someone to command the Continental Army. Samuel Adams rises, gives a kind of a long speech, you know, extolling all the virtues of what a commander should be, he going on and on and on, not mentioning by name anyone yet, and then comes to the end and he says, of course, I give you, and at this moment, John Hancock, who was the president of the Congress, he's seated in the front of the room. And he, of course, is Samuel Adams' friend, shall we say. The smile on Hancock's face is growing wider and wider because he knows who could this Massachusetts man be speaking of but him, that he should be the commander. And then, of course, Adams says, George Washington. Well, one can imagine. John Hancock. But then, to make it even worse, cousin, distant cousin, John Adams rises and I second it. Well, Hancock is this, if there had been any amicable relationship between the Adamses and Hancock, that disappeared right away. In the meantime, Washington is thoroughly embarrassed, and so he says, he leaves the room. He literally leaves the room. And of course, then the Congress votes and they appoint him, commission him, uh, commander in chief of the Continental Army by a unanimous vote, which is vitally important because what you had here was a national treaty. The army in Boston is a Yankee army. They have to have a Southern commander to unite the colonies. So the appointment of Washington had to happen. They had to have a Southern, and he was the person to, as it turns out, of course, it turns out to be a splendid choice. A splendid choice. Washington uh, serves the cause of American independence. In fact, we would not have won the American Revolution had it not been for the leadership of uh, George Washington. But Hancock is thoroughly, thoroughly disappointed. Uh, very, very disappointed that he wasn't appointed the commander of the Continental Army. I think we can be grateful that he wasn't. That's a great story, well told. You know, we should leave something for another time. And uh, that's probably a good spot to stop. Yeah, it's all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been my great. pleasure. And uh, thank you. do you think thank you, you can join us another time? We had so much fun. Yes. Well, I'd be happy to join you anytime you wish. Oh, excellent. Very good. Well, thanks to you, Bobby.